Are you, you, need some, you need some water to stir? <coughs> I might. Sir, we have for you a Hollywood coffee table. Oh, blue, beautiful. Yeah, that's, that's water Good. Water. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Could someone silence the, the phone? Mr. Barry, thank you for doing this interview for us. Glad to. Tell us about your background, where you're from, and how <clears throat> you came to Atlanta, and how you got involved with uh, the Jackson administration. I came to Atlanta in uh, the spring of 1962. <clears throat> uh, came, found a phone booth, started making calls, trying to find a job. My uh, goal was to uh, finish college. I had gone to junior college and uh, <clears throat> uh, got interested in the city of Atlanta because it was two blocks away from Georgia State. And uh, got a job as a tax clerk in the Board of Tax Assessors uh, for the city of Atlanta. And uh, <clears throat> uh, met my wife there and got married, and uh, you know, 50 years later, I was still in the city of Atlanta, and worked for the city of Atlanta for, I worked for the city for 21 years. Where and when did you first meet Mayor Jackson, under what circumstances? <clears throat> That's a good question, and I thought about that coming up today for this interview. I knew him when he became vice mayor, so we had gotten acquainted before then. Uh, I was with the city finance department by that time, and uh, he got elected vice mayor, and uh, then I, I went to the mayor's office uh, as part of my career with the city, and worked with him as, as he, when he was vice mayor, and uh, helped him some because uh, he didn't have staff. At that time, the city council didn't have staff people. And uh, Maynard was very active, and uh, he had a lot of correspondence, I remember, and we helped him handle that correspondence and do things like that for him. So I got to know him in that way. So he decides, <clears throat> he decides to run for mayor against, I guess, Sam Lassell. He did. And uh, I know that uh, that was a very intense mayoral campaign. It was. Uh, he becomes mayor. What was your position in his administration at that time? Well, I was, I had become Sam Massell's chief administrative officer by that time. Uh, I was basically a career city employee and uh, <clears throat> had been appointed uh, chief administrative officer after the chief administrative officer named Dan Sweat had left. He was the first one to occupy a position by that name. And he went on to head the Atlanta Regional Commission when it was first organized, and I then just succeeded, as we did back in those days, into the job as chief administrative officer for Sam's final two years of his four-year term. And then, of course, uh, the, the mayor's uh, uh, race started uh, that year, uh, which would have been 1969, I believe. That was when the election uh, was held. And the mayor's term would have started in January 1970. And it was a tough race. Uh, uh, Sam had gone against the establishment by getting elected mayor without the support of the business community, uh, which had supported Ivan Allen. Uh, and uh, and uh, Sam put together a coalition of <clears throat> the African-American community and liberal white community basically and uh, had gotten elected mayor and the business people were out so to speak and uh, but uh, here came Maynard this very attractive young he was about 35 years old at the time and uh, by that time the registration levels of voter registration of the African-American community was growing and he took a look at it and said I can win and uh, and he did he, he beat Sam Massell 
<clears throat> in a runoff. Uh, it was a it was a tough race. There were racial overtones at the end. Uh, Sam ran a campaign at the end that said Atlanta's a, a city too young to die or something like that. And uh, uh, so it was a it was a it was a tough time uh, in the city. And here I was, the chief administrative officer of the man he had just beaten. And uh, I had been with the city by this time about 12 or 15 years. <clears throat> and I'll never forget, Maynard came to me and he said, I like you, you're a good guy, you've been my friend, but I want my own man. <laughs> and I was uh, uh, somewhat disappointed by that. Uh, I had two young children by this time and I thought the city was going to be my career. But uh, thinking fast, I said to him, do me a favor, let me find a job, and then you hold a press conference saying how you regret me leaving. And I said, doing it, <clears throat> doing it that way, uh, my friends won't be mad at you, and it'll be better for us both. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, I got a job with uh, Cousins Properties, <clears throat> I was the manager of what is now CNN Center. In those days, it was called uh, Omni International, and uh, office buildings. And there was a there was a ice rink in the center, and uh, there was a a, a a world of Sid and Marty Croft. It was an indoor theme park which right. failed fairly quickly, and. Uh, and uh, I remember that it was uh, two years later. <clears throat> it was Christmas time. And the shops, we had a little set of shops in, this, uh, in, the, in the office complex there in the center of the atrium. And I was out walking the property, and there was Mayor Jackson. And he looked at me like it had never occurred to him before. He said, would you be interested in coming back to the city? He said, we had, we're having trouble, I'm having trouble getting the airport project started. And I didn't have to think twice. I said, absolutely, I would love to do that because I had worked on the airport project before during my career. <clears throat> and that's how I went back to the city. And, uh, and what was your position? Was your... I was head of airport uh, planning. It was an assistant airport manager type job. It was basically to oversee the midfield project. And uh, I've always thought that was a great lesson. Number one is never burn bridges, right? right? And number two, this is the kind of man that Maynard was. He, he held no animosity for, to me. Uh, we had worked together, and he knew me, and, and I knew him. And his love of the city was greater than wanting to, to do something bad to somebody who worked for a political opponent. And uh, so... I came back to the city <clears throat> after two years away and eventually became uh, the commissioner of aviation and then got a call one day from Maynard, and I was at the airport now at this time. He, the man he hired to be his chief administrative officer was a man named Jules Sugarman. Right. And Jules left <clears throat> the city to go to work for the new Carter administration. So Maynard calls me up out at the airport. This is before I became commissioner of the airport. And said, I need you to come back down here. You know how to do this job <laughs> in the city. So I became mayor's chief administrative officer uh, in that way. So, and served him, served him for two years in that capacity. And he sent me back to the airport. Because this at this time, the airport project was... Just getting started again. So tell the audience, what, what does a chief administrative officer do? Uh, it's, it's, it's in the charter of a city that was adopted uh, uh, that uh, uh, <clears throat> when, when Maynard became mayor, it was a, it was a uh, watershed in, in city government history because we went from being a weak mayor system of government to a strong mayor system of government. And the charter uh, was uh, adopted in uh, 1971 or two this new charter, completely like a new constitution. 
And it provided that the mayor could employ a chief administrative officer and delegate to him whatever he wanted to delegate, any of his powers that he wanted to delegate to this chief administrative officer, he could do so. And so it was usually the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty, the day-to-day -day operations that uh, the mayor could do the big picture stuff and get involved in what he wanted to. And uh, the, the chief administrative officer could, could handle details. I, I got to where, I probably shouldn't be telling you this, I got to where I could sign Maynard Jackson's name better than he could. Uh, because every day <clears throat> there were tons of stuff to sign. Well, you take, you have a contract that's been provided for in the budget. It's been, bids have been let. The contract has been awarded by action of city council. That resolution awarding the contract was signed by the mayor. Then it became a question of just getting the paperwork together. In the meantime, the bulldozer was out there idling, waiting to go to work. The mayor was out of town. He had meetings. He was doing all these things. All it required was his signature to start this project and get going and get it done. So I learned to sign his name. And even to this day, I will see sometimes walking in someone's office a framed letter saying congratulations on being named Citizen of the Year. And I can tell that it was my signature. <laughs> but, but anyway, he could, he could delegate to me to do that. I, of course, never did anything or signed anything or did anything that he did not know about. But it freed him up so that he didn't have to spend his days, you know. So as a chief administrative officer, were you involved in some certain <coughs> sticky situations? I was reading Gary Pomerantz's book. Yeah. And uh, I came upon this section about Emma Darnell. Yes. And I wanted you to talk about that and where you, where you were in that and, and Maynard, how Maynard dealt with that. Yes, well, Emma was and still is a unique individual. Uh, and uh, she had her way of, of doing things. And, uh, <clears throat> and sometimes they were not the mayor's way. And uh, so they, they had conflicts. And she had conflicts with a, a man named Art Cummings, who was head of purchasing as well. And Maynard terminated her. And uh, I was put in a very awkward position because I was called at the trial the city council held the trial and uh, the question turned on whether or not Ms. Darnell was incompetent. Now, now Emma was a lot of things but she was not incompetent. She knew what she was doing. She knew um, she, she knew what her plan was and uh, so I had to testify that I did not think she was incompetent. I, she could be rude she could be terse, she could be short, she could be even border on, if not insubordinate, but she was not incompetent. And so I, I had to testify to that, which didn't please the mayor, because he had fired her because he said she was incompetent. And, oh. and here I was saying that she was not, but. And what, <clears throat> what did the mayor say to you after that? No, oh, he chewed me out. And to be chewed out by Maynard Jackson was an experience, I can tell you. Why? What, 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 what did that mean? What did that mean? Well, I mean, he... Uh, he was a very eloquent man. Abs I mean, he, he could use his eloquence uh, in many ways and express it in many ways. He was a tough taskmaster. Really? Oh, yes, absolutely. He was... Uh, he, was uh, he was... As most great leaders are. I mean, he wanted things done his way. And his way was the only way. But what was his relationship with the business community during this time while you were chief administrative officer? Well, he was never intimidated by the business leaders. Uh, 
he, <laughs> I've sat in many meetings with him where business leaders, some of whom I knew, would say all the wrong things. I, I've been tempted many times to say, quit saying that. The, the issue was uh, putting, uh, finding uh, African-American uh, business people to put on boards of banks. Uh, we've, he wanted, if the city was going to do business with these banks, he wanted to have African-Americans on their boards. And you'd have these, this, 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 these dignified businessmen coming over and sitting down with the mayor and says, Mayor, there's just nobody, there's just no blacks qualified. And that would set him off in private. But he was so mannerly and, and, and such a gentleman that he would not confront them. But once they left the room, you know, you'd hear what he really felt about that sort of thing. So it, it, it was a matter of transition. It was a matter, it was a time when uh, blacks and whites did not understand each other. They, they had not known each other well. They did not know where each was coming from. To have this young uh, black man uh, speak to them and act like an equal uh, was a new experience for most of them. And uh, they had to come to grips with it. And uh, some did it better than others. Also during this during the time of this, this administration of his, he had to deal with, you know, not only someone like Emma Darnell, but he had Reggie Eves. Yes. You know, what was that situation with Reggie Eves, which should have been, from my perspective, a compatible one, but it didn't seem like it was. Well, they were they were great friends. I think they were college uh, uh, fraternity brothers. Uh, they were they they went way back, and that surprised uh, everybody that. Uh, uh, Reggie kept doing controversial things, and uh, it just came became too much. And I'm the one I say hi. The little staff there, or we, we they, uh, <clears throat> the mayor convened a meeting over at the First National Bank building. Black leaders, mainly. I don't think there were any white folk there at this time. In this meeting. And it was the decision as to what to do about Reggie. And a police cheating scandal and all this, these things were part of it. And I remember the day went on, he had a press conference scheduled for six o'clock and it was gonna be live on the evening news as to what his decision would be. And the day wore on, one o'clock came, two o'clock, three o'clock, we heard nothing. So we decided over at City Hall that we were going to do two statements. We were going to do a statement that the mayor could read on TV where he said, I have found that my great old friend Reggie Hughes is a great public servant and some of these charges against him are wrong. And he is still a valued member of our team and will be as long as I'm mayor. And the other one said, I regret very much that Mr. Reeves has taken these actions that he has taken and has reflected badly upon our police department and on my administration, and I regret that he has to be terminated. They went on for two pages each and uh, six o'clock came, the news comes on, live at this office down at the First National Bank building, and Maynard gets, gets up before the cameras, and he starts reading, and he reads a paragraph from the firing statement, and then a paragraph from we're gonna keep him statement, and we're sitting there with our mouths wide open, watching this at City Hall, wondering what's going on. His, final, his decision is to suspend Reggie and name a man named Cal Carter, who was a, a 
the retired uh, Air Force colonel that had gone to work for the city as the interim public safety commissioner. And the joke ever since was that Cal was the most surprised man in the room <laughs> when this happened. But, uh, but anyway, that's, that's one of my memories from that. From that uh, well, he, did, he eventually did let Reggie go. He did let him go, and, uh, and Reggie uh, was bitter about it for a time. And, uh, but then he eventually ran and became chairman of the Fulton County Commission. And right. I, you know, I don't know. I never asked uh, the mayor if they eventually made up or not. I don't know. I, pres I would imagine they did, knowing, knowing Maynard's uh, character, that he probably. Well, what were some of the specific things that Reggie had done that to cause such issues? Well, there was a, a cheating scandal, I was the primary problem. And, uh, one day the mayor asked me and Jerry Elder, who, who was an aide to him, a very nice lady, uh, to meet with a, uh, some detectives that were making a charge that the promotions in the uh, police department were being manipulated by handing out the answers to the exams so that this this person would know the answers and this person wouldn't and so forth. And that was the major, the major thing. But there, there were other more minor things, but that was a big, big one. And the commission, <clears throat> uh, he, he, the mayor named a couple of uh, very prominent leaders, one black, one white, to investigate the charges. And they found that, that Mr. Hughes was behind the, behind this process and uh, so that that was the primary thing so after your two years as chief administrative officer you went back to the airport i went back to the airport yep to implement uh well to get the to get the terminal built and to uh, implement his uh, program of minority uh, business enterprise participation in the construction of the airport which in terms of Maynard's legacy is one of the major things in his, his, in his legacy I mean I, mm -hmm. I guess what 35 percent of the contracts were minority owned contracts or? a little less, a little uh, less. but uh, it, was, it was more than had ever been achieved in any major public project anywhere in this country up to that time and uh, in fact, in one year, we were accounted, we, we accounted for almost 95% of all the MBE work under the FAA grants and their programs. So it was a, a, a remarkable feat of leadership on his part. And his strengths uh, really came to the fore in that he never blinked. He, uh, it was my job to go to the construction industry and say to them that this is the way we're going to do it. And you guys, we're in sort of uncharted legal territory here. And you guys can probably hang us up legally for a period of time if you choose to do so. But 75% uh, of this $500 million construction, we're, you will get if we go forward. And it's only the 25% that we're gonna find minority contractors and joint venture partners to do. So isn't it better to have 75% of 500 million or we're not gonna have a project? And Maynard's words were to me you tell them that weeds will grow. Those were, those, that's what he meant by the fact that I will stop that project. And they would, and they would say to me, is he crazy? And I said, yeah, he damn sure is. On this point, he's crazy and he will stop it. And if Maynard had blinked at any time during that process, I mean, there was tremendous pressure on him. And uh, I think that word, that weeds will grow, was aimed at me in my job 
to go carry this message because he knew that if I blinked, we'd have trouble. So it, it was, a, it was a, you know, a great example of will, of leadership, of strength, and, uh, and it worked out. It was, it was it, number one, it was the right thing to do. Now, did he always have the dream that this would become the most important airport in the country? Well, well it, it, it already, we were already, you know, we were already one of the major airports of the country. I mean, at that time. And this is why that, uh, that, I, that I thought that Mayor Franklin's compromise on the name is, was the right one because Mayor Hartsfield, as a young council member, had the vision for the airport. He drove the decision to buy the land. The, the, the terminal project that he built was opened in 1961, his last year as mayor. Uh, and it was, it was a grand project. Uh, unfortunately, the jets came in and all of a sudden we were bursting at the seams within just a five year period after that terminal opened. But, but we were already on our way to being a great airport. He just, he just took it to the next level. He took it, he, he, he made it possible, Mayor Jackson I'm talking about, took it to the next level and did it in a way that set an example morally and ethically uh, that, uh, that we can be proud of as Atlantans uh, for all time. So I think it's right to have the Jackson and Hartsfield names International Airport. On, the, on the facility, yeah. So after Maine's second term, he left office. How was he treated by the business community when he left office? Shamefully, in my opinion. This was part of my question. Yes, he left, uh, he left office uh, after two terms. He was term limited, of course, uh, uh, as far as successive terms. Uh, he could come back and run later, which he did. Uh, I think one of the, I think, I think it was terrible that he was not offered a position in one of Atlanta's major law firms. I, uh, I, I, think, I think it's nothing less than shameful that he was not. He had to go to Chicago to work for Chapman and Cutler, one of the major uh, bond firms in this country. Uh, but um, I, th I think in the intervening years, the feelings have mellowed tremendously. Uh, but in those years, uh, there was a great deal of distrust, and uh, it, it, Maynard was pushing change and and the business community resisted change. And like I said a minute ago, it was, we were in a transitional period. And so the business community had to transition into this new reality, which they did eventually, but, but it, was, it was unfortunate in my opinion that he was not treated better when he left office. So when he came back for the third term, were you still working? No. You were no longer? No. I, I, uh, I left in uh, 1983. Uh, I worked. I worked for four mayors. I worked for Mayor Allen, for Mayor Marcel, for Mayor Jackson, and for Mayor Young. But I was gone by the time he came back and ran for his third term. I'm asking everyone to tell me a give, tell me an anecdote about about Maynard, a funny one, a sad <coughs> one. Do you have one? I got hundreds. How long until? Well, give, give me. <laughs> tell me three, Mr. Bay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Maynard's uh, management style was unique. He, he he was the most naturally eloquent man that I've ever known. Uh, but he worked things out verbally as opposed to mentally. Uh, let's say that we had a major issue that we were dealing with you know, in a day. Now, the mayor's schedule is typically very busy. I mean, the Girl Scouts are coming in and the neighborhood groups are coming in and all the time we've got this major decision percolating over here, cooking, and it has to do with the city council, a major decision, convincing people to go see it his way and so forth. Well, I've 
uh, I found it intriguing to watch him. He would meet with the Girl Scouts and he would welcome them to the mayor's office, but then he would start talking about this major issue. He would, he would, be, he would be saying, now we've got this big problem, you know, and these little girls would be looking sort of puzzled, you know. And the same thing with the neighborhood group who might come in to talk about streetlights. And he would give a moment's lip service to the streetlight issue, and then he'd start talking about this big decision that he was facing. And he would do this the entire day. But by the time that six o'clock came, he had his spiel all worked out. He had his decision made, and he had the justification for it. And he had it, the logic worked out because he had been practicing it all day, all day long. You know? So I've always thought that that was a real gift, you know, that he could do this. And uh, whereas most of us would go back in a room and turn the lights down and meditate over some issue, he, he, he didn't. He did it. He did. He worked it out verbally throughout the day, which was. He must have had a lot of puzzle groups coming into those rooms. <laughs> well, he did, yeah. He did. Yeah, he did. But those were largely ceremonial things. So, but, uh, Tell me one more, another one. <laughs> well, uh, let's see. Uh, Maynard. Maynard had a, he was funny. I mean, he had a wit. Uh, he would, uh, you know, we were, we were just beginning the period that we now call politically correct, I suppose. And I remember uh, one day a spectacularly beautiful woman comes into the office and I forget the issue and I forget the reason for her being there, the meeting or anything. I just remember that she was there. And we meet with her about whatever it was, and she gets up and leaves. Well, Maynard and I look at each other, and we both are thinking the same thing. We both want to make some comment about how pretty she was, but we don't, you know, we're, we're still at that stage where we don't want to say anything inappropriate, right? And I remember Maynard finally turning to me after a few moments of silence and says, it's terrible to live in a time when you cannot make an artistic judgment. <laughs> Which uh, I've used that line many times since, that, uh, that, he was, uh, that he was fun to be around. Where were you, Mr. Braden, when you heard that he had passed away? I, I, don't, I, I, I don't recall exactly where I was, but... Uh, I remember being crushed by it. He was just 65, I think. He and I were about the same age. And uh, he was born in 38, I was born in 37. And uh, I, I remember my son called me. My son uh, was just a boy uh, when I was working in the mayor's office and Maynard would call uh, at home. And uh, I'd, I would sit down and instruct my son Jeff as to how to speak to the mayor and to make sure that he was very, very respectful and said sir and all, all, of, all of this. And uh, it had an impact on my son. And, and my, uh, my son Jeff and his son, my grandson, uh, went to the funeral service. I forget where I was, I forget, I don't know, maybe wasn't in town or something. And uh, they were interviewed by Channel 2 News because, you know, I guess they just caught them uh, coincidentally. And uh, even the grandson talked about how important this man had been to our family. And, uh, he, and, he, and he was. Well, I mean, he just, there was, when there was something very special about him. I've often thought that the word charisma was sort of invented for Maynard Jackson. I mean, he, I, he, was, he was a center of attention wherever he was. And uh, it just came, it came natural to him. And uh, I've never met anybody 
quite lucky. He's articulate, a big man. Yes. You know, Booming voice. Came into a room and took it over. Huh? He did. He certainly did. And, um, yeah, I, I think about him a lot. And uh, What do you think his legacy is to this city, Mr. Ben? Well, he, he, uh, he, he broke a lot of, uh, he broke a lot of stereotypes. Uh, you know, he he uh, he used to say that that uh, he was thinking about having his name change uh, uh, from Maynard to First Black. You know, because every time everybody referred to him as the First Black Mayor, that every time anybody introduced him to the crowd or anything like that, I think he got sort of irritated by it sometimes. Uh, but you got to, you know, uh, you got to uh, remember that Atlanta was about half and half in those years, and these two s cultures uh, had not really communicated with each other. They didn't really know each other. They were two silos. And uh, here was an educated, articulate, intelligent person who could hold his own anywhere. And all of those prejudiced people uh, had to rethink their stereotypes. They had to say, wait a minute, you know, this guy's something special. And uh, so I think he bridged that gap. It didn't certainly hurt that he got things done, like the airport, for example. and. Uh, but uh, but I think more than that to me is that, uh, that he forced uh, he he forced people to rethink their mental images of each other. Yeah, I was saying to, to uh, I guess it was to Lonnie King earlier that uh, Mr. King that you know when he became mayor it was a time when there were lots of black mayors and Tom Bradley in Los mm -hmm. Angeles and Coleman Young in Detroit and. And um, Richard Hatcher and Gary Indiana, but as time goes by, the one mayor's name that keeps coming back that we all remember is Mayor Jackson. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I think it's for some of the reasons you've stated. Yeah. You know? He was, he was a force, a natural force. That's, that's what he was. Yeah. I was, I considered it one of the. I so said I'm just very thankful that I came along at the same time and. We got to know each other. We worked together well. We, we enjoyed each other's company. And uh, I believed in what he was doing. And uh, was glad to add my, add my part to it. So during that first two terms, besides you and Angela, who else were close to him in that administration from your remembering? Uh, well, uh, you know, he had his uh, he had his uh, sort of inner circle, if you will, uh, mainly his law partners and David Franklin uh, uh, comes to mind, and uh, people that he people that he trusted, you know, outside of uh, city government, and uh, and of course he started making big changes inside city government. Uh, Lee uh, Lee Brown came along as and finally replaced Reginald Lees, and they got along very well. And uh, Maynard admired dedication in people, and he admired intelligence, you know. And uh, so he... Uh, you think he yeah. was sometimes maybe loyal to a fault? I, he probably was, uh, to tell the truth. To say that, loyalty to a fault. Yeah, he, he probably was loyalty to a fault loyal to a fault with uh, some people. He, he, uh, he allowed some people to stay longer than they should have. I, I think that's fair to say. He was, <laughs> but, uh, but once he reached the decision and you were a goner and uh, <laughs> it was, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. Yeah. He could, he, he was a big man in anyway. But he could swell up. He could puff up. 
he could he could look bigger than he was right before he you know started a tirade on something and you had to you had to be careful about telling him that it couldn't be done or you can't do this or there's a reason why that you can't do it and i found that you simply ignored him in other words a lot of times his rants were done for effect and uh Two or three days later, you know, you could then say, now, uh, I've checked into what you told me to do, and it's going to involve this and this and this and this and this and this. And he'd say, well, okay, you know. But at the moment, you didn't do it. You, d you just said, okay, if you want me to go out here and jump over this building, you know, okay, okay, I'll do it. And then walk out, and then later come back and say, you know, I'm not be too, too good an idea. After a day or two had passed. <laughs> did he ever talk about his grandfather? Oh his yes, father? he did. Yeah, he was a, he, he, well, he was, he was a hero to him, obviously, and uh, he was he was always telling stories about his about his uh, grandfather and about. Uh, uh, I think he came back to. Uh, I think he came moved back here to Atlanta as a youngster, uh, and. Uh, he and his grandfather, his grandfather may have been retired by that by this time, and they spent a lot of time together, and uh, and evidently he would take him around on his rounds, up and down Auburn Avenue, and uh, he would he would talk about that, and talk about the stories of how his grandfather had such a big influence on him, and uh, and his, he, he was very proud of his family, and always speaking of uh, the the. Uh, I think one of the sisters was a, 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 a opera singer, and uh, and he was proud of his proud of his children and proud of proud of his family overall. Yeah. I think we got Wendy, Any? Fuzzy. Uh, selfishly, could you pull out one of, another one of those anecdotes? <laughs> 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 one of those stories. You know what I want? Um, because. <laughs> much is talked about the, the politician, but could you tell us um, a time where you got a chance to not just see his humanity, but a time where you saw this is Maynard the man, the, you know, this is the husband, this is the father, this is the son, an, an antidote where that kind of bled through um, at a moment where you may not have well, I, I don't know. Let me let me just tell you a few things that that uh, uh, sort of brought out his character a little bit to me, and was uh, I, I thought about it when you said loyal to a fault. Uh, everybody's favorite police officer was Eldrin Bell, uh, but Eldrin had his faults. Eldrin would get into trouble when there was no need to get into trouble. I mean, I mean. Uh, uh, so one day Maynard told me, he said, I'm going to have to fire Eldrin and uh, I want you to go with me because I want a witness. And uh, at that time, uh, the, he, he had an apartment on Peachtree, uh, uh, right where the uh, Nations Bank Plaza is now. On North, I think we're North Avenue cr crosses Peach Street. Yes, he had an apartment there, and we went over, and had he he didn't he didn't want to do it in any kind of public place, so we went over, uh, and Eldrin met us there. Well, Maynard barely got the words out of his mouth, you know, that I must have to let you go. He just caused so much trouble, and and. You know that. Uh, well, Eldrin starts. Eldrin starts as only he could or can. Justifying whatever it was he had done that was the straw that broke the camel's back, and and pleaded with the mayor, pleaded, you know, to not do this, and that he'll watch his ways, and from now on, you know, he'll be in touch. Well. 
Eldrin whined and wheedled for an hour almost, as I recall it. And Maynard changed his mind. And he said, okay. And I remember that we went down and got in the car to go back to City Hall, and Maynard never said a word to me. He never said a word about the big talk about going over to fire Eldrin. <laughs> he was, you know, here was an old friend and somebody that they had gotten along with so many, and so he, he, he just decided that I'm not going to do this, you know, which brought, I, I, thought, I thought it was a, something of his character that, that he knew he shouldn't be playing the tough guy with this old friend and old buddy, even all, with all the mistakes that he had, that he had made. And uh, so I admired him for it. But he was so abashed by his change of mind after all of his talk that he wouldn't say a word. He, we drove back to City Hall in absolute silence, as I remember. And, uh, <laughs> and he, he was a... Uh, Maynard, Maynard had a great sense of honor. I, I, uh, I, I used to tell people that he would have been at home in the 17th century, you know, back when people put such a high status on their word or... Uh, uh, or ethical behavior or moral behavior or, uh, I mean, he had, this, he had this outsized sense of honor uh, to him. I mean, it, uh, you, didn't, you, you didn't do this. In other words, I recall suggesting to him shortcuts that we might take if we got into a tough situation on something, you know? I said, look, we can just ignore you know, the niceties here, and, and uh, no, 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 we start puffing up, you know, again. But no, 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 you know, we will, we will do it straight. And if a city council member ever came to me at the airport and said, uh, I want you to give my brother-in-law a contract, or I want you to I want you to do something that would be wrong. All I had to do was tell Maynard about it, you know. And he said, you let me handle that. And sure enough, it was handled. I mean, it, it, he got straightened out immediately. It was never any, I mean, people, again now, going back to the white folk who would, you know, look at me and say, okay, you're over there, you know, dealing with all these folks who are, bending the rules and so forth. And I said, you you ought to be in a room when I suggest bending the rules with Maynard Jackson, you know, because it's, it's a, because he, he would stand for nothing uh, in, in, in those days. But it may have been because of the airport, he knew the airport project was so important to his legacy that he did not want a black mark. We would find, on occasion, a joint venture partner that we had vetted and so forth, but it wound up, he was just sitting back and taking a check from the contractor without being involved in the project. It used to drive him nuts. And he would, he would, uh, after, after fussing at us for, you know, uh, not having vetted it properly, and, and he'd stop it immediately. And he'd be the order it stopped right then and there and this guy would be out on his ear you know he's a straight shooter he was he sure was and uh, this, this is what i've told i've spent a career telling people that because so so many people were so anxious to believe the opposite so you should say that phrase straight shooter right? i said he was he was a straight shooter and I have spent a career telling people that he was a straight shooter because so many people were so anxious to believe the opposite. Okay. Anything else? I'm going to ask you yeah. Okay. Room time. You need to just while. sit for 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I can give you 30 seconds. Room time. Room time. If I'm talking like this, will be, be 31. Town. It'll be 30. Okay. There we go. I wish you guys well with this. Uh, oh, excuse me.
sorry. Let's start over again. Okay, we're good. Thank you.